feels strange not recording at home. I bet. Yeah. Welcome to the Trash Cats Trash Cast. I'm Richard. I'm Steven. And today, we are recording at midnight on a Puerto Rican beach. This is a very special episode. It is so fucking wild out here. It is got Steven out on the fucking, out in the scene, out in the wild. I know, I feel bad. Checking out the the sights, man. (laughs) Ricky's stuck in Detroit, but uh, it's literally pitch black out here, except a couple stars in the sky. I can barely see the fucking ocean waves. Like, if I didn't hear the waves, I could just walk straight, and I wouldn't know when I was going to hit the water. Oh, that's cool. It's so surreal. It feels like an alien an alien beach just floating in space. I'll, I'll post some pictures. I think I posted a couple already, but I literally just threw my backpack on top of my shirt in the sand, popped the shitty USB microphone into my laptop, and we're recording on the beach at midnight. I'm on roaming data with a hotspot, and we may have some uh, connection issues, but but I think it's going to work. Hell yeah. I think, I, you know, I, I can't wait to see how much sand damage you get in your laptop. I, so far, so good, but there have been a couple sand bugs that I've had to shoo away, but uh, honestly... Oh, those, those nasty sand bugs. Those damn sand bugs. But it's honestly, walking on the beach at night like this is probably one of the most awe-inspiring things I've experienced in quite a while. It's really beautiful. I'm sure. It's got to be breathtaking. The pictures you showed me are, like, very beautiful. Yeah. The one, me and John kept laughing, it looks like an indie album cover. (laughs) (laughs) My headphones on. Yeah. Yeah. John's John's out here. He's out somewhere exploring the night, getting samples for his music. We've been uh, recording different audio samples and birds and Puerto Rican in- insects and stuff, and it's really cool. I-, I wish you were with me, man. We'd have a blast. Yeah, man. I wish I was, too. That'd be pretty fucking dope. I, I read... <laughs> I thought about what you just said. John's out there uh, uh, getting samples for his music. I don't think... He's just, like, walking around the beach, just, like, looking down, like, finding shiny rocks and shells, <laughs> like, picking up things he's gonna put in his music. Just, like... <laughs> we recorded... Metadata <laughs> put this picture of a seashell I found in Puerto Rico. In the <laughs> Dude, we, there's these... There's these birds that they almost look like like a mix between a raven and a starling. They're like tiny, pitch black, ultra black, little starlings with these beady yellow eyes. And they chirp really high pitched. Like, whoop, you should hear them. So they're definitely back there somewhere. And uh, they're... they're some of them have this like war paint where there there's a, a line directly down their face that's red and they they look oh uh, that's cool so menacing and then there's been iguanas out here some of them are like four feet long but i guess right now is the the time of year i guess their mating season is like december january so right now there's um the new baby iguanas running around. They look like the the little lizards we have in Cincinnati, but they're actually baby iguanas. That's cool. A little like the little anoles or whatever the fuck they're called. Yeah, they look just like them, but they're slightly lighter green. And I guess the more green they are, the younger they are. And then they slowly turn like more typical iguana colors. You know, typical iguana colors. Typical iguana behavior, too. <laughs> I saw, uh, I was playing basketball, getting some street ball in, and, uh, I, I, my, the basketball went into the, the forest, and I don't know if you call it a forest or jungle, it's more jungle-like, but I, like, walked into a big heron nest, I think it was, it looked just like a blue heron, but I didn't get a close enough look, but I, like, walked into their, their nest under these palm trees, it was so cool. Oh, that's rad. Yeah. You pull one of those classic comical movie bits where you pick up the basketball but mistakenly pick up one of its eggs. <laughs> and then <laughs> Zoinks? <laughs> and it chased me away. Oh, no. <laughs> How's your week been, man? It's been good. I, you know, I've been in Detroit, not, you know, Puerto <laughs> Rico, but it's been good. Um, it's so crazy we I, can record this far away on a podcast. Yeah. You know, it's wild. This is, this is, um... You know, this is the future, and we're here, and we're in it. 
I, I've been uh, intermingling these cats. The, the uh, aforementioned cat I picked up last week and took in. Uh, he's been doing really, really good. Jeremy? Jeremy. <laughs> Young Jeremy, man. You say it he's better been than doing <laughs> Little Jeremy? Yeah. He's been doing really good, man. He's he's really, like, he, he gives my cat space, which is good because she has bad social anxiety issues and um, does not like other people or animals. And, well, like, they'll get up close and, like, you know, touch noses almost, and then she'll just hiss right in his face. Um, which, you know, she could just attack him, but, like, she wants to connect a little bit, I guess. Yeah. So he just kind of, like, you know, plays submissive and rolls on his back and shows his belly. And and she's, you know, allows it. They're going to be cuddle so, bunnies you know, in no time. Exactly. Yeah. Super but, cute. You so know. You're, you're holding down the, the United States for me while I'm gone, huh? Yeah, yeah. I'm keeping an eye on everything <laughs> over here. <laughs> I'm making sure everything runs smooth in your absence. <laughs> it's so gorgeous out here. I could stay all night, but we do have a couple things to, to check out. We're going to talk about some stuff we've been thinking about and uh, an interesting news story. So this all starts with my deranged YouTube searches. They, they sometimes lead to obscure recommended videos, mm-hmm. and it's really goofy what YouTube decides they want to show me based on my my uh (laughs) previous watches so (laughs) i keep getting it and i think in part because of my location changing i keep getting these old they're old people doing some sort of spanish christian church stuff and they're Mm -hmm. like talking about the gospel in spanish and i was recommended one that had under 20 views Oh. Which I've never had YouTube recommend a video that was under 20 views, right? Prime real and estate. Yeah, it's bizarre. And, and I'm too curious not to investigate. Now, it's really easy. Like, you know, we think of the church as the evil monolith, or at least I fucking do. Mm-hmm. And, and it's really easy to think like small, obscure churches that with a, or at least that have a small audience or less dangerous less potent and it's really easy to think that these dumbass old people spouting crazy shit don't matter like who the fuck cares Mm -hmm. who cares if they think some dude crucified thousands of years ago matters i and you know what does it change my life and it's just really easy to overlook these seemingly benign ramblings but you know last week we just talked about crucifixion and how how this changes people's minds, their brain rot, and letting a small cancer fester leads to bigger cancers. And we had a lovely little reminder of this just yesterday in the news. Oh, Jesus. (laughs) More than 300 dead in Kenyan evangelical cults. Jesus fucking Christ. Dude, that's high score shit. We're like... (laughs) It's like high score shit. We've been waiting for somebody to beat Jim Jones for a long time. And while I may, <laughs> while I believe in Jim Jones, I think someone out there can do it better. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's going to one-up him one day. Absolutely. We can totally set new records if we just put our minds to it. The latest bodies recovered at a doomsday cult. Those are always kind of fun. A doomsday cult in Kenya pushed the death toll there past 300, reported ABC News. Authorities warn that the death toll will end up much higher and have the cult's alleged leader, a former taxi driver named Paul Nathendiga McKenzie, in custody. Damn, he had a big (laughs) glow-up. Taxi driver to mass murder cult mastermind? Dude. It it all starts with, you just get that one, one, you know, uh, um, person in the back of your cab that you know they tell a friend and then they tell a friend and suddenly you're you know shouting in a microphone in front of a bunch of people you have a whole about, multi-level marketing death call in no time oh absolutely <laughs> yeah, multi-marketing is the, the, multi-level marketing is exactly the, the way it goes he was selling uh he was seven, selling like slim fast out of the back of his car <laughs> i mean he must be a charismatic motherfucker that's wild yeah 
The search for mass graves is still underway in the Shakola Forest, where the first victims, some dead, others alive, but weakened and emaciated, were discovered on April 13th. Since then, the series of grim discoveries have revealed a macabre scandal, dubbed the Shakala Forest Massacre. More than 600 people have been reported missing by concerned relatives. Police believe that most of the bodies exhumed were those of the Good News International Church followers, an evangelical sect founded in 2003 by the self-proclaimed Pastor Mackenzie, who advocated fasting until death in order to, quote, meet Jesus. Oof. I, I do want to also say, I didn't say, you know, uh, uh, emphasize this part, but they do put pastor in quotation marks uh, when they <laughs> say his name earlier. Yeah. Dude, starvation is just a rough way to go, too. I mean, that's... It really? That takes some time? Yeah. Starvation is the reported cause of death in most cases, but this is not a case of mass suicide alone. A government pathologist told media that many of the victims were beaten and choked to death. The Sunday Times reported that the children were targeted first. Now, this is very similar to... Jim Jones in the sense many people think everyone willingly drank the Kool-Aid. But since the initial news reporting, there's been a ton of evidence that many people were held down, injected, forced to drink. The kids were also targeted first. This is like classic mass cult behavior where it may appear that it was all everyone chose, but oftentimes at these pivotal moments where everyone is choosing to fucking die, a lot of people start to think a little bit more clearly and uh, second guess or doubt or try to leave or abort the the actions, but the, the hardcore believers don't give them that option. Yeah, that's the... I mean, it really is kind of the, the, the scarier part of it when you think like, okay... The pe- the fact that these people were like they get brainwashed to the point where they're willing to do this that's that's terrifying enough as it is. But when they get brainwashed to the point where if someone else doesn't want to go through with it, they're gonna make them anyways. Yeah, they're starving their own and other people's children. They're forcing other. They're killing. They're yeah, like you said, it's not just suicide. It's murders and abuse, and that's just so gnarly. A man helping the police with the investigation also described to the Sunday Times the alleged brutal treatment of the children, saying they were shut in huts for five days without food or water. Then they wrapped them in blankets and buried them, even the ones still breathing, he was quoted as saying. It's alleged that the cult followers were told they would reach heaven faster if they starved to death. I'm happy to give the hot take on this one. All the fucking adults there deserve to die. Yeah, I know. For what I, they did to those children. I 100% I agree with you. I'm so fucked. The BBC also found Mackenzie's archive sermons. In a passionate, raspy voice, Pastor Mackenzie delivers his sermon to a large congregation in thrall to his apocalyptic themes. Quote, We are about to win the battle. Let no one turn back. The journey is about to be accomplished, end quote, reads a banner across the screen. One series of videos on the church's YouTube channel has the caption, End Time Kids, and shows a group of young children delivering messages to the camera. Oof, that, re- that reminds me of, uh, oh fuck, D and Doe, the uh, spaceship losers, where they made the... the the videos of them right before they drank the Kool-Aid to hop on the alien ship. Oh, Jesus. You know who I'm talking about. We've talked about this one before. I'm, gee, I know we've talked about it before. I'm, I'm not uh, well-versed in the the story. Cults game. I yeah. love cults. They're, the whole group... I, j- the explanations of like psychologists and I don't know, different researchers when they talk about the effects of groupthink, like, um, what's, what's the other one where you side with your captors? I'm blanking. Oh, um, Stockholm Syndrome. Yes, Stockholm Syndrome. I think so much of that shit is bullshit. I understand those mental effects are real, but I can't ever allow the excuse of groupthink allow you to kill your own children. 
it's not acceptable. Yeah, agreed. Heaven's Gate. That's the other Kool-Aid alien one. Fun. In right before they committed suicide to hop on Haley's Comet uh, to join the alien race, they made all these like exit interview videos where they all have shaved heads and they're talking about their their love for their leaders and it it, it is honestly it's a pretty astonishing series of videos because many of them are crying and others are in exhalation exhalation where they're like so happy i might be using mm-hmm. it. yeah but they're like crying in happiness and you can tell like with some of them it's super genuine where they truly believe they finally are making it to this moment and they're about to be saved and others you can tell even if it's subconscious that they're outwardly happy but they're like distraught in that they're so conflicted in this decision they're making and the the videos have you know the leaders uh d and doe are um they're truly at peace and you get to see these interviews with all the followers trying to come to grips with where their actions led them yeah that's that's so sad that's so hard to look at and think about yeah it's just the the absolute brainwash and then <sighs> yeah that's a that's a fucking scourge on the earth yeah it just any you know it's so easy to ignore the small evils like a small spanish youtube ministry but it's even if not every single one ends up this catastrophic this is where these ideas always will lead with enough time mm-hmm. with enough power behind it, it i mean we talked about that before too it was like if less people become religious the ones that hang on you know the the ones that are still there are hanging they're they're so far in the one direction it's going to continue to get more more, more aggressive and yeah yeah like in yeah t- to that point like 50 years from now when the percent of non-religiously affiliated peoples increasingly higher as it's been trending the people that hold on to their religions are going to become increasingly hardened ignorant and likely more extreme archaic and insane <laughs> yeah as the as the church starts you know needing needing some new money to line its its pockets yeah. we'll, they'll uh, they'll start stepping up stepping up some tactics it's just like how many more death cults do we need i just, like end time thinking is so oh man it's just so defeated where where even if it's like doomsday preppers like there's some practicality in being prepared for some things but the obsession with end times with being at the rapture the end of the world like that type of thinking is such a defeated position or perspective to take yeah because there's never much focus on enduring it or surviving (laughs) 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 you're like this is it guys (laughs) yeah (laughs) kill your kids now because this is it (laughs) yeah we're gonna we're gonna uh you know cut to the chase we're not gonna wait for the apocalypse to happen we're gonna form our own yeah (sighs) makes it makes it you know gonna you know do god a favor and just you know we'll do we'll get knock this one out on our own guys yeah we got this just some you know some good fun stuff to start a podcast with <laughs> yeah real fun real fun things to talk about while you're sitting on the beach <laughs> it's a really nice juxtaposition though it's so beautiful and strange here nothing can keep me down it's a good it's like balance you're, 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 you're finally in a place where your mind can wander <laughs> this yeah. is what happens absolutely <laughs> what, what have you been thinking about I, I do got a couple ideas that we can play with that I'm curious where you will help push these thoughts but is there anything specific you've been feeling or thinking this week um Honestly, I've been I've been really conscious of like my stress levels in the last few weeks, but like making sure that I don't overdo it. 
because we have a lot going on this year, like more, like way more than last year, and it's it's yeah, kind of coming on fast. So I want to make sure that I don't burn out too soon. Good for you. Last year, I, I started feeling it, you know, like, m- you know, early August and, you know, mid-August or so, I started really feeling burnt. And then, like, by the time September came around, like, we still had events going on. We still had a lot, a lot of stuff to do. But I was, like, I was... I f- not I just not that I felt defeated I just there is I felt you know burnt I was Run done down. I was not I, I was waiting like working every single day just for like the the release of a day off when it would come and I don't want to live that way I don't want to you know spend every single day like okay I just got to get through a couple more days and then I get to the weekend um, I've done that before at other jobs and it sucks and I most of the time at my job it's not like that currently so uh, yeah. I just want to avoid that happening sooner this year because we're taking on more things yeah it's a it's a marathon not a sprint and exactly it sounds like you're doing a good job of kind of protecting yourself because no one else will protect you you know like you you have a cool boss that's kind of an ex- yeah that's I was just when you said that I was thinking like he's really good about like hey you need a day off but that's that's kind of an exceptional thing and as a, a general thing as a, a, an adult out in the the big world with big pants you know there yeah. aren't many people there to protect you it's all no you have to put yourself first yeah you can. I'm, I'm a 100 percent firm believer of you always put yourself first absolutely you have to uh um uh, what, what's what, what do they tell you on the plane? You were just there, um, you know. Uh, put on your own. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna put on your own mask before you help someone else. And then cut the tubes to everyone else's, so you have. Yeah, <laughs> so you get. <laughs> yes. You have to run go. around cutting all theirs first, and then put yours on. Yeah, and then put yours. On. <laughs> or else you and can't the, reach their supply. That oxygen's not flowing through the tubes. It's uh, once you sever it, it, it stops. <laughs> That's science. It's, you know, air pressure and, uh, you know, talk to, a, talk to a pilot, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, speaking of putting yourself first, I do have kind of two, two ideas I've been thinking about. And it's been nice having the additional free time to kind of ponder and get lost in, in thoughts I want to be lost in. So here's my big two vacation concepts. Mm-hmm. Identity and communication. So, I'm traveling with, which, if I hear someone say that, especially in a podcast, because most podcasts are lame as shit, anytime you hear someone talk about, oh, we're going to talk about identity and communication, it's like, shut the fuck up, all right? Like, <laughs> we're going to make this cool, this is philosophy shit. So, I'm traveling with my family, and <laughs> I love my family. It's not always easy to get along with, because many of us have different beliefs than the others and there's often like an underlying tension or sense of things unsaid or unresolved but mm-hmm. overall we get along fairly well and so far it's been pretty smooth and communication is an obvious element at play with that and i've been thinking about communication especially with not necessarily my family but in general communication with people that see differently than you and I've been thinking about identity and I've been kind of pondering this idea of leaving a place as one person and returning as another Mm -hmm. mm-hmm you feel positively in that way like you you feel like you will or that you want to um to be honest, neither. I I don't want to, for sure, and I don't think I will. But I think I think that you can, and I think that people do. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Doctor Seuss said this to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, like, I, I definitely I definitely agree with you. You know, it's there. I mean, there's books. There's you know, isn't that like the the core concept of Eat, Pray, Love? Because like she no traveled idea. and like, you know, it changed her life. Like pants. these new experiences that she experienced changed her life. Sounds about right. Based on the title, I may deduce that with my Sherlock capabilities. Yes. <laughs> I, I I haven't read Eat, Play, Pray, Love, but I've listened to interviews with the author and. You just got um, the tattoo, I, right? <laughs> yeah, I just got it. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's got this uh, e pray love across my forehead. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, fuck. That's my live, laugh, love, man. <laughs> well, like, you've, you've spoken a lot in the past about finding yourself in new places. And I've kind of in jest brought up the, the idea of losing parts of yourself. And that's definitely kind of a joke, but I think there's definitely truth to both of those. And I also... Yeah. I also kind of wonder either way if your identity can potentially inherently change due to a new place due to a new location new context can your identity change and part of the big question of that is like what is our true identity if you intentionally traveled in a disguise like you put on the mustache you dye the hair uh you got the goofy glasses modify your body let's say sci-fi world like we're getting at root philosophy ideas of like mm-hmm. who we are at our core true identity if we had a um sci-fi uh like little laser gun that you could laser your body and literally you could change skin color piercings tattoos whatever the any thing you want sex change whatever full creative ability to manipulate your body if you traveled in this new form would you be the same person in a different place or does your true identity remain the same for for example if you did this use the laser gun and you stayed where you are same life same context same locations you would feel different but other people would remember your past self they would know that part of your identity if you chose to tell them or that it was revealed or whatever like there would be artifacts of who you used to be but if you change and we're in a new place what keeps your identity from being completely new and I, what kind of matters the most of that is what makes us who we are and is that dependent or independent on how others see us and i have some interesting thoughts or arguments but i want to see what you're thinking first the first thing that comes to mind are you familiar with the philosopher's acts Mm -mm. that sounds Um, awesome so it's uh it is it's very cool it's an idea kind of like a problem thing with it's a you know thought is this Whatever. the beheading thing where your body No. Ends? Okay. That's no, the Loki's so wager. Okay. <laughs> the, um, so the, the idea is that a philosopher, has, or so, someone has an axe. Okay. Okay. He uses it for a while until the blade wears out, and he replaces the blade, replaces the head of the axe. Okay. Uh, oh, he uses, yeah. He then uses it for yeah. a bit longer until the handle breaks. Yeah. The head's still okay, so he keeps the, the head on it, but he, put, he puts a new handle on the head. Is the axe that he has now the same axe that he started with? Yep. Yeah. What, and the I, idea of that, like, it is, it is, you know, when you talk about losing parts of yourself in when you travel, I, I recognize that as being a thing. It, I feel like the thing that you lose the most of is, this is going to sound corny as fuck, is, is like ignorance. Or, you know, different perceptions that you had before, you know, uh, but, but that come from a place of ignorance. That's an interesting idea in the sense that, because that, that's, you know, like an art additive and subtractive mediums. So that almost takes the, yeah. like I know that's just like an example, but that almost takes the perspective that ignorance is something you inherently hold with you until you shed it right like the idea of losing right. parts that, that's, yourself that's like the shedding your skin like a snake kind of deal but yeah it's interesting yeah and that th- that would be the question then is is ignorance a thing that you hold with you or is it a lack of something is it and i think it could be, yeah sure. i think it could be both i think there are i mean i think there are definitely situations where people hold on to their ignorance because they choose to rather than it's something that you you may have but you you are willing you know uh, um you know if you're intelligent and want to grow and progress you are willing to shed 
and but then that I still I don't know I guess that it's a glass half empty glass half full kind of thing if you think about it where it's like is this something that you have that you lose or is it a hole in you that you replace that you fill with something when you travel yeah or is it you're there there was something there and you dropped it and you filled it back up and it can be both yeah and that that plays well into what I'm trying to understand so I've definitely said it on here before but I, I it was actually really interesting one of the rehabs I was at uh, where the court made me do an inpatient for a year. Um, one of their big questions on the intake, it, this was like a private, when I say private facility, it was a, a ghetto series of apartments in Price Hill where, where it just wasn't state run. So it's you know, technically private, but the, it was, had a Christian uh, leader and like undercurrent, even though to get federal funding, you're not supposed to whatever but one of the first questions this guy who ran it this old christian dude was like you walk in their office and you're like begging to get in so you don't get felony charges but you also do not want to be there it's a real weird mix of emotions and like Mm -hmm. practicality but one of the first questions he asks is who are you and it's like oh i'm steven and it's like no who are you and that's like that was like a reoccurring theme there, right? Is like knowing truly who you are. And we've spoke about it before, but I think the two big things of like what is life, what is the point of life, and it's to learn who we are and how to die. And, and those are two things that require the other. You don't learn how to die, right, until you know who you are. Yeah. But that question of who we are is is so much more difficult than it seems on the surface because does our identity exist in a vacuum like are we outside of space and time just in a a locked room on the uh, edge of the universe in the dark are we ourselves is our core identity Mm -hmm. solid state is it a solid state drive or is it plastic flexible are we without other people we couldn't be our ourself like there's so many questions on yeah to what makes that i think there's there's the thing that popped into my mind is i think there's a lot of people that are you know i mean obviously actions speak louder than words and your actions the idea being that like you are what you do not so much what you think, but I think that there has to be some level of that, of, you know, what you feel, what you think, and, like, what you, what you do believe. may be a reaction to, yeah, it's like the, the, the things that are going on in your head, while not as representative as uh, of, like, who you are, because, you know, everybody has all kinds of different thoughts all the time. You know, good people think bad things sometimes, you know, and and not everybody's a hundred percent bad all the time. The the thoughts that go through your head, whether it's different forms of empathy or whatever, that should be called into who you are as a person. But then the action would be what you end up actually doing with that decision that you make, or with the information that you've you know, thought or process processed in your head. And I, I feel I like I like this line of questioning of like who who are we? Who are you and what does that mean? I think that's a the never ending question. Yeah. Well ideally it has some sort of end and I, I kind when of die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do have a, a kind of unsteady conclusion that I, I we might be able to shape out but I have a perfect case story re- relevant to what you just said so I think I've mentioned this dude on here before there was this guy I met in high school and I like through friends of friends whatever um, then drugs at some point but we had bumped into each other like maybe three times over like five years but we knew other people who knew each other right 
distant acquaintances. Mm -hmm. And at some point later in life, he uh, we bump into each other at a party or something, and he wants some drugs, and I happen to have said drugs. And uh, because we knew people, I float him, right? Turns out he dies a week later, overdoses, unrelated to anything of my involvement. He's dead. He owes me ten bucks. Mm -hmm. This slimy piece of shit died owing me money. That's not cool. That's not fucking cool, man. It's pretty fucked up. Not cool at all. So, all right, my my, my point pick, is... Pick yourself up by the fucking bootstraps. <laughs> get me my fucking money. Baby, yeah. I actually... Die tomorrow. I have brought this one up before because at the time, he was one of the... He wasn't the first person I knew to die, but he was among that first wave of people, and it always... It was like a strange impact where like other people I knew really closely and him I hardly knew. And it's it felt it felt unresolved. So to me, this guy was really purely a piece of shit. And as a, a very young adult at the time, I would have made the very likely erroneous assumption that that was this this kid really i mean his his whole identity right that right he fucked yeah he fucked me over he died doing something dumb and obviously you know a bad person at you know with age it's like very very obvious to me now that was likely a very small part of who he was now if we right. take an example like that but we we make it more extreme we have someone like that total piece of shit fucks over everyone in his life right for years and years mm -hmm. an alcoholic father type dude and then he leaves he abandons the family goes to another country and lives a whole alternative life he feels terrible he tries to repent but he can never face going back to the old version of himself and he lives a perfect life from there on out does everything right he uh spends his life volunteering for orphans he gives every penny he makes to the poor he feeds the stray dogs all that shit for the the second half of his life and then he dies quietly alone no one knows at home what happened to him they only knows the the dad that left them Right, but he had a whole another half of life on the other end of like the moral spectrum. What is that person's identity? Because to the people he left, they only see the the one facet, the one side of who they were, and it, it it's hard to like. To, yeah, because our identity, a, you know, isn't ours. It's, Alone. part of perspective it's, right yeah yeah but but even more than that i think like to us we have a core identity but other people have a part of it too like our identity isn't necessarily who we actually are it's the part of us that other people perceive and mm -hmm. in turn how we perceive ourselves i like that thought i think it gets complicated because identity feels like it's something that is truly ours, but I don't know if you can have identity in a vacuum in that room alone in the dark. I don't know if it exists the way like who we are it is, I think, different than our identity in a way. So, so there's this question of who we are. Does it exist in a vacuum? Does it exist in the lock room? And we need this mirror of others. The, the crux of this concept is that our identity is essentially a stone that we carry in our chest. It's always with us, but throughout our life, we find and lose these little pieces of it, or big pieces. And we may give these small pieces to friends or big chunks to our family and loved ones. And sometimes people may even steal pieces from us or us from them. Mm -hmm. And I... I I like this idea, like, ima imagine walking in a strange place past a crowd of strangers. Part of how we see ourselves becomes how we perceive others seeing us. 
So as you pass the crowd, little powdered flakes of dust from the core identity stone in our chest float their way. And on on a vulnerable day, when you're feeling fragile, maybe a piece bigger than it should chips off. But the innermost core of our stone identity, who we truly are, is ours and ours alone. I like this thought process because I think it's it's deep and there's a lot to it and there's a lot that can be perceived in different ways maybe a little bit but I think that what this thought process does is open up is open up people's worldview a little bit I think what it kind of does is forces you to be a little more empathetic, be a little bit more, put yourself into the, you know, if you're trying to understand the identity that others perceive Mm. from you, you have to put yourself in someone else's shoes for that. Well, I kind of think, and that that definitely stems from, it, it really is drawing a separation between self and identity. Like part the mm-hmm. core, the core of that identity stone is our self, but that is not the all of our identity. Yeah, and then the the mirror, the the perception of others is is what makes the illusion of who people think we are, even if it doesn't truly represent. Our it kind of reminds self. me of the uh, what's the the Japanese thing with uh, everyone has three faces. It's the the yeah. face that the you know the the general public sees, the face your friends and family see, and then the face that only you see, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, I've kind of on my own added to this concept, and I to to be a hundred percent honest, I don't know how much because this is something I've heard years ago, but it's it's always stuck with me. The shards of ourself in others I, I don't really yeah. know where my adding and the original started at but this idea is the base concept I believe is derived primarily from the work of philosopher Wittgenstein Ludwig Wittgenstein and he's a really interesting character that I definitely want us to do an episode on here at, in the future his work focused primarily on communication he was a a math guy like did a philosophical math and he was into music and his story is really interesting i believe he was a soldier he grew up catholic and three of his four brothers committed suicide at separate times in his life and he his parents died he inherited all this money gave it away and just really he only wrote one book on philosophy his entire life the second book came out after his death it was like not quite finished but he was uh very prominent he's you know to this day he died in the 1940s 50s but to this day he's like one of the most prominent philosophers of the last whatever years he really focused on philosophy earlier in life but by the later period of his work specifically with that second book that came out after his death he had become tired of philosophy basically and his focus went solely to communication and he has this idea that's really interesting so we're going to check this out so one of his primary ideas was that of the fly bottle a corked glass bottle full of flies <laughs> you know i actually relate to that a lot um i had left a monster in my car oh, uh, a couple days ago and i came back in to find a bunch of fruit flies in my and i that's i left the window open uh in my garage and you know i uh I, i've been having fruit flies in my car and it's been a constant battle um as they slowly die off but the first day was there's just a couple and then the second day there is a whole bunch of them and i would open the window and they would not leave even as i'm going down the interstate that's quite the literal interpretation i'm not sure what Wittgenstein would think but (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, it's a you know the my car is a cork, cork glass bottle and it is full of flies. <laughs> <laughs> so Wittgenstein famously wrote in his second book, the one after his death, Philosophical Investigations, that the aim of his philosophy was to quote show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. His observation was a direct attack on the parochial approaches philosophers take and then entangle themselves in their own naughty problems. <laughs> you know, I, I, t- I fully get it, man. My philosophy for the last few days has been, how do I get these flies out of the <laughs> bottle that is my car? Well, he, so he basically focuses on communication after the idea of the fly bottle because he he comes to think that all of the pondering of philosophy all the philosophers all their bullshit all the philosophy writing was all the equivalent of being a fly trapped in a glass bottle so then later in his work he shifts his focus to communication which is really interesting because i've never directly heard a philosopher put the onus of their work on interpersonal communication so it, it gets pretty weird so Wittgenstein thought that the pursuit of philosophy in a traditional sense is pointless philosophers who scoured far and wide for a structured logical form applicable to everything were deluded and wasting their time much like a fly who constantly tries to escape a glass bottle by bashing its brains against the glass Wittgenstein saw it as his job to show those tenacious philosophers out of the top of the fly bottle and to see philosophy for what it really is, a futile attempt to find an all-encompassing logical form of thought behind the mess that is ordinary language. He essentially believed that philosophical thought fails in importance to true communication. I actually relate to that in a in a pretty strong way. I like the idea that when when you're looking at it from such a small bubble kind of thing, there's there's not a lot to be learned or like when you're just going based on like okay, these are the things that we know and you're not expanding you know the the potential and you're not thinking outside the box. I mean, that's kind of the same idea, right? Is think outside the box just you know described in a a little more flowery language i think that i I think it's really cool i think it's a a fun idea i think it's a good thought process of that like i said earlier i feel like that's that's opening people's worldviews If, if you go down this this uh you know track of these these train tracks of thought as i hear the train in the back uh outside the yeah, I, I like it. I like the thought process. I, I got to think about it more to see how much I completely agree with it. But right now, I, I, I want to say I'm 100% on it. Yeah, well, I, I think I wanted to kind of introduce him a bit. because He has a lot of... Oh, no, is he a bad guy? He, well, he kind of... He, he like, beat some children. <laughs> <laughs> that's no big deal, right? It was like corporal punishment yeah. at school. He like knocked you know, out some t- kids. Told all of his, told all of his followers to starve themselves. And he does have strong Catholic leanings and influence, but he, yeah, it's everyone did back then. But there's a really interesting quote he has about God that I would love to explore another time. But in general, his perspective is really unique, and because his focus is on language so much. His writings are very potent, and I wanted to kind of introduce him as a character, and we will definitely be revisiting him and diving deeper. But r- real quick, I do I need to... I think there's someone out here on the beach, or like a couple people. I don't know. I'm not... It's fine, but I'm just not sure if I'm technically allowed to be here, so I'm about to like kind of quietly pack up my shit and walk back to the hotel... Uh, oh, gonna, man, we think we can get an interview with a local? No. <laughs> it's probably not a local at the hotel. <laughs> We're not doing that. Um, I'm going to keep recording, though, so this will be interesting. We might get some uh, casino background song or sounds or some, some weird shit in the background, but I'm, I'm going to walk up with the microphone. But um, So he basically comes to this conclusion that 
all philosophy is psychobabble because no one can mm-hmm. truly understand what you're saying. Like when I'm speaking to you, recording right now, we're both interpreting each other differently than we're intending to be understood. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that our identity plays a part of that as well. And part of his writing was that when we speak to another human being, we are essentially conjuring pictures. And whatever picture that other person is receiving or series of pictures, that imagery, is dictating how they perceive us and our thoughts, ideas, our communication to them. And that we have no direct control of the pictures they are receiving. Right. And that the only factor that matters, far superior to anything so silly as philosophy is language in our communication the most precise accurate descriptive the right language to to make the most accurate picture possible to communicate to the other person so he got to the point where he's like fuck philosophy the only thing that matters is communication true communication and i find that as a, a fascinating concept especially as an artist yeah I, I mean, it's we've talked somewhat about that in in the past of like the idea of prefacing the things that you say can sometimes be frustrating and annoying. Yeah. But for the purposes of clarification, context is important for everything, especially when you're trying to drive home a specific point or uh, you know an, an image. You know the the image that you want someone to have in their mind, the the language that you use and all of the details possible that you can provide that lend itself to sharing the idea in the way that you want it to be shared. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's critical. That's, I mean, that is communication, right? Yeah. And I, I think in general, we've talked a lot about our yin yang, but in, in the communication realm, you often go for specificity and prefacing and i think i tend to be on the other end of the spectrum where i i am going for emotional tone a bit more and sacrificing specificity which i think gives us a good balance but what's what's really difficult is i feel like i'm a person who when i speak people should be understanding me that they should understand better that i'm saying what I feel and that people are misinterpreting which makes his his perspective alluring to me Mm -hmm. but you know when you listen to someone speak and they're bitter yeah and and they say all the right words but you can like feel the bitterness like dripping from the the things they speak yeah and it's like a almost subconscious thing where the words they're using should make the right picture for your brain to interpret but something about their bitterness makes that picture like stained desaturated the colors are wrong and your brain just interprets it differently and i feel something whereas you know we both tried to work on like prefacing and having a better level of specificity but i also feel like the layers of um, emotion and intentional intentional emotional emphasis matter so much too and i think people often lose that in the you know it's the basic how you say it not what you say but there's something that when you speak passionately or with emotion i feel other people can pick it up and I think sometimes I may even think they pick it up more than maybe they are, and I'm losing, losing um, in that communication. But I, I just feel like it's so important that it, that is one of the primary parts of the picture you send to the other person is the emotion behind the words you say. I think there there is some truth in that, but I, I feel like when when you're relying or when you focus on that you open yourself up to be um interpreted incorrectly it's vulnerable way to speak 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think by doing, I mean, it's like, you know, sending a text message, like when you type something out, the way that you're saying it in your head is different than the way that they're reading it. And it's, you know, it's an old trope of like, you know, uh, someone reading it and thinking that the other person's angry about something or that they're upset when they're not, or they are upset and yeah. like being like, but they can't tell or they're like being passive aggressive or something. But like there's, I think relying on one or the other is, is not it's a balance. I, ideal. Yeah. There's a balance because even with, even when any of you try to describe those emotions, th- those emotions are interpreted differently as well. So there's only so much you can really do there. But opening yourself up to all of them and being conscious of them is definitely the preferred option if you can if you can uh, manage it. I just thought it was fascinating that a philosopher would say, "Fuck." writing philosophy because no one's going to understand what I mean truly. No one's yeah. truly going to understand the perspective, the meaning of my philosophical writing because it's communication is such a complicated thing that philosophy is futile and that the only thing we should ever concentrate on is how we communicate. I just, th- that's mind blowing to mm-hmm. me and, and very like uh, almost defeatist or I mean he believes we're all flies in a bottle like that's it's a very like dark take in a way yeah I was gonna say that there's definitely like I can understand the frustration from it I can understand the idea of well fuck it no one's gonna get it anyways <laughs> yeah. but also like that's what philosophy is right like that's how philosophy grows is by someone shares their thoughts and ideas and then someone else hears that and they're like I like the these parts of this but I feel like this instead and then they share their view I feel like these parts can be filled in different ways I mean like that's that's all philosophy is is just we sharing our thoughts on something and we think that this is a, a better way to live kind of thing trying to to know the unknowable and it, in many ways it I don't know his work intimately enough to, to say for certain but it almost it almost feels that he thought not only of philosophy but the world in a vacuum that it it wasn't a collective thing for him it was i mean clearly he had struggles with communication in some sense or another he was known for stomping out of a room when he didn't feel heard or that his words weren't heard or or, or his words weren't understood how he wanted them and I, i think to your point knowing the unknowable is impossible right and the right. goal should be that through the mirror of others we keep painting better pictures to send each other that your idea gets slightly more beautiful slightly more accurate to the truth more resembling of what we believe that unknown is you speak it you send it to me and hopefully i farther it and pass it back to you or someone else Right, and it's hard when you're the fly thing. in the bottle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. When you're just a fucking fly in a in a Toyota Rav Four, and you can't because <laughs> there's a limited amount of flies to paint that picture and share it to. When you're it takes, a, it takes a lot of flies to paint a picture. Yeah, it takes many of them just to hold the damn brush. <laughs> <laughs> it takes for fucking ever. They're slow as shit. <laughs> Oh, uh, that was a dad joke, Steve. Dude, that was. That was rough. Well, I think... I I don't know. I like that. I don't know where I agree or... I Part of me really feels that... Agrees with him in a lot of ways based on me, communication. Because I, I mm-hmm. in many ways feel that it's all futile. But I enjoy the painting, the pictures, even if they don't fucking matter. But the the shards of identity, I think I feel very strongly. And I'd look forward to exploring either of those and definitely more of Wittgenstein. And then the rest of this beach, too. I'm about to walk this night beach and see how far I can go. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I I gotta ditch the laptop first and then go back out. I'm almost in my room. Nice. 
Yeah, the 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 shards of yourself thing. I really I like that too. I think there. I never really thought about it in that perspective, but like, yeah, I definitely want to touch on that more. I, I definitely have thoughts on that. I like the idea of the when you said people. You know, some people steal pieces from you it's like oh yeah, yeah like if you've been in like a a bad relationship or something and like you know they're removing a sense of like trust or you know they're removing from you these components that made you more giving in the past or more you Absolutely. know that's why we build our walls up and stuff after you know so or like your role models we steal pieces from them too it's such a weird yeah. give and take you know but i i like the 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 imagery of even walking past strangers just everywhere we travel in this world bits and pieces of our self our identity are flaking off and sometimes those flakes are picked up by others sometimes they stand you know you you do a graffiti tag on the the picnic bench it's a little flake of your your identity that that left you and floated to that table you know I, i'd like that idea of picking up and putting down pieces of ourselves and taking them from others and giving them I just I, I just thought of a really good <laughs> a really good analogy for this. You open a like a, a dark metal like a, a black metal bar and it's like, you know, brutal in every way possible. It's the most <laughs> like you know, satanic place you could possibly make with its aesthetics or whatever. But one by one hipsters start showing up. <laughs> and then they get, you know, it gets more, more hipsters start coming through, and there, then suddenly, suddenly your your black metal bar is a hipster hangout spot. Yeah, how many hipsters because it's does perceived? it take to make an indie bar? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they leave behind the impression of it's a hipster bar. <laughs> well, dude, I'm looking forward to. It, it felt strange to record in a new place. I look forward to both being back home with my girlfriend and cat and then uh being able to to record on my comfy couch and see where where we take this next time hell yeah that sounds like a plan to me brother oh yeah thanks again for listening everybody thank you to approaching human for the use of his music you can find his work on soundcloud at approaching dash human thanks john i can see you from here but you don't know i'm saying this but we're gonna have you on the podcast again soon <laughs> yeah as I say, you, you can find him somewhere on a beach in puerto rico <laughs> <laughs> make sure to check out the show page at trash cats trash cast on instagram for news and arts from the show check out facebook for the memes for the memes if you're super bored you can check out my trash yard on instagram at skyzix s-k-y-z-i-c-x you can also find john's music on soundcloud and and uh, next week, we got a couple topics we're taking a look at, but we got some really cool stuff ahead. And I know we've been saying a lot lately, but we've had more support. I don't know. I don't know what's happening with the pod, but it, it's it's really cool and unexpected to get anyone listening and just feels extra awesome that, you know, people are are sticking around and that it, it's slowly growing so thank you guys very much we're over here resting on our loyals or our lo- our loyals our laurels uh, we're resting you know, on loyal lines a, yeah steven took his vacation he's got his toes in the sand he's smoking cigars and drinking cognac because we got people listening to the podcast now. we kept it rolling we haven't missed a week even when we're bo- either of us have been out of town that's wild dude yeah hell yeah that's that's all your work <laughs> the teamwork bro Love you, man. Hope uh, you have a good rest of the night, and I guess uh, we'll see you guys next week. Hell yeah, that's going to be all for us today. Stay classy, eat trashy. Go fast, eat trash. I, I think it was. I also think it was good. My sinuses were fucking with me at the end of that podcast, though. 
I'm I'm fighting it over here. It's not like it's my like my nose. It's I can't like do the fucking nasal spray or something. It's just like it. That's that that gloopy fucking booger in my throat kind of feeling. That's just mucus and shit. <laughs> I don't think you're allowed to say that word, Stephen. <laughs> 